If I saw Kristen go in front of me, I'd be suggestive. <laughs> Welcome everyone, uh, this is our Wolfcast review of the fifth episode of House of the Dragon, We Light the Way. We are the vassal of the King's Grave, um, and just to remind everyone that this could potentially spoil all published works by George R. R. Martin, including Fire and Blood, so yeah, we kind of know who wins this war, so if you don't want to know, uh, don't stick around. But we won't be spoiling Game of Thrones, the show from season four, five uh, to the end, because some of us, including me, uh, have not watched it. Also, listeners, a warning that we are going to be talking about uh, suicide, suicidal thoughts and uh, sexual violence in this episode. So take care of yourselves and don't listen in if that's triggering for you. So I'm Mary and I'm Mary on Discord. Uh, I'm joined today by Bina. Hey, it's Bina007 on the Discord. I also want to say, if anyone has watched Formula One, Drive to Survive, and wants to talk about it in depth, please contact me on the Discord. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> uh, thanks, Bina. We also have David. Hi, David. David HHH on the Discord and the forums, if they're still around, and everything else. <laughs> Elle, do you want to introduce yourself in case you have to correct our shocking lack of knowledge? Yeah, uh, Elle Nettles on Discord, and I'm only here in my historic capacity. Thank you. All right. Um, we also have Jock. Yeah, Jock. Um, Jock, um, both real life and on the Discord. Sarah. Hey, it's Sarah, a.k.a. Dr. Blood. The Tall. Hey, hey you. Hey, guys. Um... A bit uh, under the weather, but um, I, I needed to vent, I think, so. <laughs> Thank you for your sacrifice. <laughs> uh, and we also have Xander. Hello, uh, Lord Baron in the VO Capers. Okay, so full house. Um, welcome, everyone. We'll start with ratings, uh, lemon cake ratings. I'm going to do it in the same order. Uh, Bina, do you want to start? Yeah, I mean, it's... Oh. I think last week's episode for me was so brilliantly George and nuanced and the writing was so good and layered and the ambiguities were intentional and thought provoking. And I think this episode was almost the opposite, right? Because it was all action, you know, so much happened. It's all setting up plot for the time jump. I found it less satisfying, but still good. But I don't know, maybe like a, if I was a five last time, maybe a 3.75 this time. All right. Um, David, what's your opinion? Um, I'm going to give it a four and a half. It wasn't perfect, but I definitely liked it. It, you know, was a Game of Thrones slash this world wedding. So, you know, a lot was going to happen and it certainly did. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and, and it was eventful and it all made sense. And... You know, even if it wasn't word for word what we got in the books, it all does make sense from what we know from the books. So I can take that as, you know, our extrapolations of what's going on in this world. Since we didn't get exactly, you know, from, from the book, it, you know, with it being a history, we got sort of interpretations and some things left out. So, but it all fits to me. So I'm okay with it. Yeah, I see what you mean. I agree. I think it's it's one of the things that make this story um, really good for adaptation because there's there's room to to change a few things. Uh, Al, do you want to give us lemon cake ratings or? Oh, um, very similar to Bina. Um, last week I felt was a lot more personally fulfilling for me. Um, in that kind of capacity, definitely more action this week compared to last week, but I was definitely more satisfied last week, though I was still rated really well, probably a 4.5 for me for this particular one. Lots of action, uh, definitely full steam ahead. Uh, we're really kind of, I'm um, seeing that nice descending kind of thing going on. So I really appreciate that. So yeah, that's about right. Cool. Uh, Chuck, what about you? 
probably would be about a three and a half, but I have to give it a whole extra point for um, Laris' strong performance. So, yeah, Laris strong. Um, like He felt like token esque for them. He'd escaped from Lings of Power and um, just invaded the scene. All right. Um, Sarah? Um, I will preface this by saying I think it was brilliantly acted and mm-hmm. all of the characters were well serviced, but I felt like in terms of pacing, um, this episode was the least satisfying for me. Um, I felt like we were in an AP class and the exam was coming up and we were just trying to cram in all the stuff that needed to happen um, in time for the jump. So, um, you know, all that said, I think I would still probably give it a a 3.8 or even a four um, because the show overall is still brilliant, but um, I was much less engaged with this episode and I felt like I was just trying to keep up, which I did not enjoy as much as some of the other ones. Yeah, same. Um, Patrick, what about you? Well, um, let's start out by saying I think that the uh, the show in general, and the production and everything is better than most TV. And by that merit, it is should be, you know, valued higher. But if you just see it as a HBO production of a J- George R. R. Martin uh, book, I think that uh, this episode felt the least like his story and the most like a Game of Thrones, which I have, I'm sorry to say to any listeners who still like it, I have soured on. <laughs> uh, so I felt, I felt completely disengaged in most of the time, in most of this, because it basically was all the things that I didn't like with Game of Thrones. So I'll give it a 2.5. Um, and, um, and that's not compared to other shows, it's compared to itself and the, the, the material it's provided by now, for now. So yeah, mm-hmm. 2.5. Okay, so you, you're our low rating for the week, um, at least until Xander says his piece. I don't know what you thought about it. Uh, yeah, I'm going the opposite direction. I love this episode. Um, because mm-hmm. <laughs> like I didn't watch Game of Thrones past like a little bit of the second season, so like to me, this is just it feels so aw- a song of ice and fire in a way I can't describe that I'm just loving it. Um, so I'm giving it five out of five Kristen Cole meat pies. Oh, <laughs> oh wow. There you go. Um, okay, so I round it up. I think I'll give it a 3.5 myself. So almost, yeah, quite low compared to you guys. Um, I was just really not okay with all of the very explicit violence um, in in this episode specifically. Um, I mean, not, a, not all of it is explicit, but it, it just, I didn't feel good afterwards. So that might just have been my mood for the day, but yeah, the whole combination of like violence, so many things happening and not really understanding what's going on. Um, even though I kind of know the story, it, it didn't feel very good. Um, so yeah, three point five for me. So um, yeah, so many things happen uh, in this episode that I felt like the easiest way uh, to to deal with it w- would just be to go in the order of the episode and just trying to tie things together a bit but so I guess the first thing we see is uh, Rhea's death so that's um, Damon's first wife uh, the one he hates and (laughs) he didn't want to go back to in the veil Um, the show definitely um, like that it strongly suggests that he uh, caused her death uh, although it's kind of unclear if how much of how much bad luck uh, is involved there? What did you guys think uh, about this first scene? I like it just because I feel like the show is making Damon too likable, and I kind of I like stuff like this to make him seem you know show how much of a horrible person he actually is. I also like it because I think it's the show writers trying to show 
when you have these ambiguous moments in the book because they have multiple narrators or it's just a throwaway line, they try and put that ambiguity in because you can litigate how far he was responsible. Um, I think it comes down to me thinking, why is he alone in the middle of nowhere, covered in a hood without an mm. obvious dragon if he weren't there to kill her? But obviously the fact that her horse rears as she goes to get her bow and it's startled um, maybe brings some ambiguity. But to me, Damon is up to no good. And I just loved, I, I loved the whole energy she has. She seems amazing. And, I, you know, the throwaway line again at his impotence Yep. Um, I think was really fascinating. I mean, later we find out that her neck was broken and her face bashes, so he must have really gone to town once right. she wants to be cut away. But yeah. I, to me, it's like it, it can't be that ambiguous because why was he there if not to, if not to do it? I, I had the impression that he was trying to, or he was sort of considering grabbing the reins or spooking the horse or I mean, to me it looked like he was force force pushing the horse which i did not really appreciate or understand but um <laughs> but i i think her neck was broken when she hit the ground because she was not moving and she didn't really right. react when he like stepped on her arm or anything like that so um i i think that she probably would have been dead in this world either way and he just like made sure which i don't know i don't know where that leaves us but yeah also if you want if if he left her there and she was found by what, her cousin or whatever it would have been there would have been questions why not why he was there and what was his purpose there so by killing her he made sure that nobody could actually point a finger to him so yeah i think it was necessary in his psycho mind I agree, and that's that's the way I read it as well. Like the fact that she she had a her neck broken from the fall, and yeah. But I, I was uh, grateful that they didn't actually show us the killing blow because I just we didn't want to see that going in first scene in the episode. Um, and I'm I'm kind of sad that we didn't get more time with her because she she yeah seemed like a a great uh, character in just a few seconds we we got to see her really um so that was the first uh scene of the episode and then we move directly if i'm not mistaken um to addison and i mean otto leaving king's landing uh like there's probably one shot of the of the boat but we don't really care let's go to Alison's and Odo uh discussion and then and then Laris strong uh clearly manipulating Alison um and I, I have questions about that but let's talk about the um, her discussion with her father so he clearly states uh the threat to Alison's children in there uh which is almost the first time it's been said that clearly I think uh, which I found interesting like yes finally let's lay out a few of the uh, issues at play here um what did you think i think they used too much time on it and not just here not not just here but on it during the whole episode i think they really it's it's, it's one of the my things i don't like about this episode is that it's so condensed into a few thoughts because they they haven't spent much time on it beforehand so they need to hammer it in with the characters that we know so that we know the stakes when they change the, change the actors. Um, it's, yeah, I don't, yeah. Uh, it's It was too obvious and too forced and condensed. I, I agree. Um, I think, you know, I mean, sort of my preface to all of the points that I make is that it was brilliantly acted. But, um, I, I mean, I think it was clear, yeah, that he was trying to like kind of plant this this seed in her and um, make sure that she didn't deviate from the path that he had set her on. Um, but I I also think that it was really interesting how in that moment it was pretty clear to me that she didn't buy it, but that it very clearly set the stage for her her shock and horror and what felt like otherwise a very um, dramatic shift from her later in the episode so i thought that part was well done but and i see why they included it but yeah patrick it just feels like they were ticking boxes to like set up the the jump and this definitely felt like one of those um instances 
I mean, I feel like we've needed we needed a good reason for her to turn on Reyna and to make the decisions that she does and to wear the green dress. And I feel like this scene gave it to us. You know, I mean, I up until now she hasn't had as much of a personal stake in all of this. And I think the yeah, they're gonna come for you and your kid, and they're gonna she's gonna have them killed. Gave the stakes that that I think she needed. So I mean, I think I think I think. Elson needed motivation, and and we got it here. Maybe maybe something may think it was driving it home a little too hard, but I th- I thought we needed a reason for it, and we got it. And and I and I think the audience needed to understand it too. And I think that's what this scene gave us. But they already said that they already said it, in in like they're already talking about that a lot. A few few if throughout the other episodes that it she's not going to be accepted the way that because she's a woman and stuff like Renera and um and i think that it's it, it doesn't have to be spelled out i think I, I, yeah i mean i don't know from from yeah. our naive point of view of uh modern yeah. viewers who don't immediately go to murder if right. they don't get what they <laughs> want uh, it's not that right. obvious that Renera could go this way and actually right. would would she actually because this felt to me this whole episode like um like a self-fulfilling prophecy like maybe she wouldn't have gone there and maybe it it wouldn't have been as like was the war such uh so obvious and uh, inevitable is is my question i guess but um we'll get there also with Collis and Rainis uh discussion I mean, strategically, it feels very stupid, doesn't it? Because, or tactically, I should say. Because surely she's at her worst strength when her children are small. Surely the, the plot is to bend the knee, to be subservient, to swear your allegiance to the new queen. Go away and gather your strength and forces. Wait for your children to be grown. But I guess that's the time jump, maybe. But I just thought, hmm, okay. I didn't get why she went suddenly so dressing in green in this episode. I didn't feel that was clearly laid out to me at all. I think it had everything to do with the Kristen Cole scene, but right. yeah, and we'll right. get there. Yeah. yeah, I just I don't. Yeah, I don't. I don't. This is such a weird, horrible way to say this, but like I don't get that she really cares that much about her children. That this would have been such a. I mean, obviously, like no mother wants to see their children killed, and you know, but it felt much more rivalrous than. I, I sort of have felt in the past that Allison was like, oh, she's, you know, I'm not gonna let her do that to me or whatever, but um, her her detachment from the kids and also like the absence of what would now be what, like a five-year-old Aegon just has felt very um, like glaring to me. Like, they were like, look, it's a baby. And then like, we just haven't seen him. Yeah, they had to establish her as a mother who loves her children that in some way redeems her actions in the way that Cersei, the only redeeming thing was that he, she genuinely did love her children. And they haven't done that here. Yeah. So it does come off as like a, you know, like the best friend you have in high school where you love them, but you hate them, like your frenemies, like something out of Gossip Girl. Like, oh, you didn't tell me that you lost your virginity to this guy. And then the other one would be like, yeah, but you didn't tell me you were going to shag my dad. You know, like, yeah, totally. it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't yeah. feel like it's a game of thrones. It feels like the game of the sixth form common room. Does it feels like Mean Girls at this point? Yeah, like yeah, it feels like she found the burn book. It feels like Blair versus Serena. It which is really it dates me. (laughs) But isn't that (laughs) part of the maybe part of the message as well that that um, at the at the end of it, uh, wars are brought up by uh, just people having childish reactions and and rivalries right uh in a way so i think it's not that it, it's not that ridiculous that they would use that to explain why she goes to to to, to such uh i mean what started all, all of this so it it didn't uh i it didn't bother me so much but i it, it felt sad mostly because finally mm. we get we get the, the thing the rivalry exposed and it's even worse with larry strong who um comes up just after that after that discussion and he tells her about renee's tea from the night that she maybe had sex with damon 
Um, and it all comes off so so obviously manipulative, and I found that not well done at all. Agree. I mean, Agree. Just back to the, the previous scene very yeah. quickly. Does it? It also seems weird that she wouldn't consult her father. Okay, we can get to it in the ballroom scene, maybe, but yeah, I agree. This was obviously manipulative, and she comes across as very stupid for falling for it. I think Laris is such a caricature. Like, I, I was, I mean, it's, I don't know, I don't necessarily want to say that it's ableist or that it's, you know, but it just feels like everything that they didn't do to and with Tyrion to make him this kind of token, like, oh he's evil and you know he's like he's almost like a like a richard the third in moore's you know where there's no at least at this point like there's no real nuance to him and he's kind of just like that evil guy who scopes around and whispers poison in people's ears and i just i was disappointed in that based on his introduction in the hunting episode because i felt like there was going to be more to him than that and i hope that there is but this scene like did not pay that off in a way that i was comfortable with in defense of the scene other than it being so bad that it's good, is also that he um, pointed to a Blavosi plant, said this shouldn't be here, and it's a perfect, um, um, basically, the lemon tree and Blavos sort of theorize and that Pleasant and Jays does the perfect response to that. So, <laughs> so that's for us book readers. Uh, yeah. Yep. Um, so they're going to Driftmark. They travel by boat, uh, which is not uh, a good idea for Viserys, apparently. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so the parents uh, struck their bargain. Uh, they discussed things like uh, the names the, of name of the children when they're born and stuff like that. While uh, Rhaenyra and and Lenor are having their own little bargain on the beach. Um, let's start with their parents. Um, I thought that Rhaenys uh, sounded quite wisely prudent, and I wish everyone was more like her, but I guess we wouldn't have a story if they were. <laughs> True. Uh, yeah, and she stated that this is so weird and unbecoming for him, Viserys, to come here, uh, ask for uh, Lena to, to marry, Lena to marry Rhaenyra and then just leaves. Um, and that felt weird to me as well, uh, that he wouldn't stay, that like um, this didn't feel uh, like the way it should have been done. Uh, what, what do you think? Yeah, I didn't understand why they sailed for, I mean, God only knows how long and then like stayed for the afternoon and then just right. dipped. like it was so weird and it felt like a health resource like a waste of Viserys is obviously dwindling health resources and um yeah I mean obviously like he needed to kind of impress um the Valerian house and and Corliss and kind of um I don't know but yeah Marie to your other point like I I was really impressed at how um perceptive and um almost like disengaged and and kind of amused um Rainey seemed to be about the whole process like she just seems very zen about everything but yet she was still mm -hmm. noticing the fact that he was missing fingers like the fact that she picked up on that like instantly and mm -hmm. and you know shifted her her perceptions of it. i don't know i i really liked her character in that scene um I mean, I think in terms of the why did they come just for the afternoon is i think it shows how important it was that Viserys get get Corliss to agree to this, and that and what a bad position he was there, and that he needs Corliss back, and he needs this wedding to happen. So I mean, you know, it was probably not the best thing for him to have to go all this way for the you know couple of hours he was there, but it was that important that he be there and do it in person, because without him in person, it may not have gone, it might not have happened. I think it's it's just like a dog with its tail between its leg right. kind of thing, you know. Like, hey, I fucked up, um, so I'm here now uh, to fix it. I'm going to go lie down. Basically, I have a very Asian view of this, which is Viserys should never have gone. It's ridiculous. It so undermines his authority. He should have summoned Corliss, saying, I'm greatly honoring your house by marrying your son to my heir, and you will take the terms I offer, yeah. as would any 
aristocratic house. I mean, and I think it's summed up in his speech later about, am I considered a good king? Yes, you bought peace, but at some at some extent to, to diminish your monarchy. And um, no good can come of this. One of my cousins got married in Asian marriages, if they're arranged, it's very much that the girl's side comes to you for the engagement if you're the boy's side. And that's a total power move because the girl is always subservient. And for whatever reason, in this particular case, we as the boy's side went to the girl's side. And to this day, there will be, um, sorry, it's the other way around. We hosted the girl's side. And to this day, there are old aunties who say that's a bad marriage. It was a horrible marriage because we conceded ground at the outset. And that's why it ended up so badly. It's amazing. Oh, wow. Yeah. But isn't, okay. that, isn't that the Sarah's in a nutshell? I mean, yeah. He conceded <laughs> I mean, that's ground, who. He's, he's, He's but that's, the that's pitch. So then when, yeah. So when they all walk into that that hall at the end for the ball, cock a hoop, you know, coming in, boss man. And you just think, the Viserys, you total, I mean, your brother may be impotent, but you're basically rendering yourself politically impotent by ceding ground. It just made me so furious for him. That, <laughs> as that's a, as a, as a, him. As a good that's age, the character. I was just shouting. Yeah, I was shouting at the screen, but it's beautifully played, and Paddy Considine's acting is superb. Oh, so frustrating. So this is a, this is another part of the of the episode that made me wonder um, if if this all could have been avoided, or at least like who who's right in this? Like Rainis is like there is going to be a war. She's not going to be accepted. There 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 is going to be fighting, and this is putting our son in danger. And Collis is like, no, and we're powerful, it's going to be all right. Um, and in a very confident and ambitious way. Um, so is he like blind not to see what's going to happen? Or, or is, it, is it easy to say for me because I know what's going to happen? It always seems a bit like, like no one really understands the plight the the life of a dragon other than the Targaryens really, I mean it's, it's sometimes it feels like when when we deal with the other houses there's some some how lesser in a way in a, in a sense that they might not perceive the whole picture and they don't because they don't have the prophecy but but more so than that and I think that uh, Corlys with Aaron seems lesser than his uh, his wife in in his un- grasping of the situation. I didn't feel that way until this episode and I was I was really disappointed. I felt like they just gutted his character in this episode and I think part of it was the, you know, it's just a phase reaction to to Leonor's homosexuality which was just like I don't know, but it um problematic, I'll say. But um yeah, it just it just felt so like he's been such a such a, a smooth character, I guess, until this point. And he just felt like I don't know, maybe he was blinded, Bina, by by exactly the kind of concessions that you were talking about. Like maybe he was just like, I finally got him on the ropes, and like that was all he could think. But it just, oof, I yeah, I don't know. He he didn't seem like the same character to me in this episode at all. I uh, I have to say that. I th- thought that that specific uh, quote was completely unnecessary. Um, yeah, and I also I don't think that Corliss is very sway or any swing swab or anything like that. He, like the character, constantly like yells in at the small council, <laughs> demands some action and stuff like that. Well, where if you were really you know, intelligent and politically minded, he would not have uh, have done that in the, that way. He would try to work behind the scenes. Uh, he basically, the only way he gets his way is to go with a rogue uh, brother and, and not uh, get his way in the small council. So, yeah, I don't know. I guess maybe I thought he was more in tune with Rainey's, um and, and her kind of aloofness. Um then but i mean i see what you're saying for sure like with the the kind of demands that he was making but i don't know he just felt like damon light in this episode with like all of the drama and none of the charisma which was very disappointing for me yeah i completely agree with call is this was disappointing for me as well Bina, you wanted to mention something about the children's name right are they going to be targaryens or valarians 
Yeah, and another echo of how I feel real world experience. Like this feels like it's a fantasy based on medieval times and it should have nothing to do with modern life. And yet it feels <laughs> like with Indian arranged marriages, a lot of it does. And certainly with this, it definitely felt relevant on the day of the Queen's funeral because one of the major um, sources of consternation when the Queen married Philip um, Mountbatten um, was whether his children would take her name and the concession he wanted them to be Mountbatten Windsors I think and eventually they became Windsors because she is the crown and the crown should pass to a Windsor it is the royal house of Windsor but it severely pissed him off and his Otto High Towerish um, godfather slash uncle Lord Mountbatten and it's very interesting that when you see um, Prince Harry who obviously has taken arguably a rebellious route he has called his children Mountbatten Windsors, but Prince William's children are Windsors. So even in, in modern times, and I know a modern monarchy is something of a contradiction in terms, this question of, and you know, Philip was rumoured to have said, I'm the only man in England whose children won't bear my name. Um, it's still it's still a talking point. Um, I thought the, the, um, the compromise was actually rather elegant, and this is where Viserys excels. In, in these sorts of political compromises. In many ways, he'd be a superb modern politician and a coalition prime minister, but he's a bad medieval monarch. I feel like he does pick his battles very carefully, but maybe just not enough of them. <laughs> Definitely. Um, I deal to the sort of uh, building up the, to the scene, how it um, went up the stairs and up to the courtyard and all that. Like, I felt like it really built to it quite well. Yeah, I agree with also the kind of um, disappointment that the uh, seat uh, is not a bit more ground. Like, it's so gloomy and I guess, yes, it's raining, so that makes sense. But it, it, it doesn't feel like the castle of the second most powerful house uh, in the kingdom. But then again, uh, King's Landing also feels very gloomy and, and not... Um, very magnificent so well um like um this is coming from Yuzon, so like it could be complete bullshit but um um like he said like they even have like um one of the horns that's like piles of gold and stuff and was speaking about leading them because of that and they did have like a museum set up which i thought was pretty cool like some of the artifacts even had plaques on them like explaining what they were and stuff um, and I, I enjoyed or appreciated the fact that he seemed also to have a Lego hobby. And I feel like if he had spent some time sharing his city model with the Sarahs, that maybe they would have found a little bit more common ground. <laughs> <laughs> let's, big, let's build a big model, just the two of us. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, what about Rhaenyra and Nano? To me, they seem quite naive to believe that this could work and would not raise issues. They're young and dumb. Yeah. <laughs> also, like, um, Bina, was it you that said uh, that it sounded like the wine talk from Schitt's Creek? Yes, I definitely felt that the explanation of some liking goose rather than duck was a direct allusion to you. I love Schitt's Creek because it's a world where homophobia just doesn't exist and it shows you a future that could be. And that description, I think, of um, being, well, not even being bisexual, I, I like the wine, not the bottle, I think is a, has become iconic, hasn't it? And beautifully so. So I felt that this was the writers maybe subconsciously or even consciously nodding toward that, which I'm here for. It also struck me as an echo of, I think it was Tywin saying like, oh, you know, His Majesty doesn't like vegetables either, but if we serve vegetables, he'll eat them. <laughs> Like, um, that there's this weird sort of elementary motif with sexual preference that, that runs through, like, or that it had in common with that moment, which I always thought was really funny. So I enjoyed, I enjoyed it. And then I enjoyed the callback later where he was like, was I the goose? <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. So Rhaenyra Kristen on the boat quickly, again, he's naive, he's naive. They're very careless around each other, in my opinion, like, there's always people around on a boat, like sailors, making everything work the way it should work. So 
this didn't feel like a good place to have this private discussion about the fact that they had sex. Um, and yeah, I got very big Aries Ocart vibes uh, from Christy mm-hmm. Paul. This is the yeah. point where is t- he is still heartbreaking and then afterwards it gets annoying. <laughs> Do you think though that this, so last week we talked a lot about you know, whether he was was into it or whether he was being abused, you know, if I mean, obviously there's still the power issue, but I mean, as much as he's regretting it on some level, he's he's really like doubling down on it. He's, you know, I, I want to marry you. Come marry me. So that makes me wonder now how much he really didn't want to do it last, you know, when the last week when we were talking about it. I... I was still with him and maybe thinking along those lines, David, when he delivered Mm -hmm. the you could marry me line, Mm -hmm. um, because that was very, you know, it was very, very well delivered. Um, But at Mm -hmm. the end, when she has rejected him, he becomes like white cloak incel angry that he thought this was a way to recover his honor and his Mm -hmm. cloak and to restore the power dynamic in their relationship to something that he was more comfortable with that she would be completely dependent on him she would have no more status she would have no way of coming back from this thing and i i just i felt so like angry at the end of the scene that he was clearly in it for himself he didn't he didn't want her beyond her agreeing to let him be the the man in the relationship instead of him being her whore um which you know <laughs> I don't know. It, I think he. I think he really. Um, he really tipped his hand at the end of that scene, and it, it wasn't about her at all. It was about how he felt bad for what had happened, and and wanted to make himself Damn. feel better. And it just made me really mad. What had happened to him and his honor? Those nice guy vibes really bothered me too. Mm-hmm. A lot. Thank you. Thank you. I think I have a third interpretation. <laughs> which is probably good as a reflection on their writing that it allows for it, which is that I think he was a romantic, relatively low-born fool who had mythologized being um, someone who takes a vow and that he didn't initiate it for sure. He would never have aspired to it, but maybe enjoyed it while it was happening and now has to rationalize it after the fact. And you could interpret that as it's all about him and it's quite selfish, but I think actually it's quite mournful and similarly, again, naive. She's never going to marry him. She's not going to run off, run off with you to, to another city, right? To be no one. And to I be think, a no one. <laughs> and if you do believe he was sexually assaulted and that he, that there was no um, modern conception of modern consent, like that there just isn't room for consent in a world where the crown has commanded you to have sex with her Mm -hmm. then maybe the marriage is what he needs to tell himself he wasn't raped to tell himself that this wasn't sexual assault so I almost see it as sometimes you read accounts which are very tragic about you know sexual abuse and rape victims who turn their abuser into a love story like people say well why did you Mm -hmm. stick around after he did this like a lot of a lot of people who are victims do Because they have to psychosexually create a narrative that romanticizes or gives post hoc agency to themselves. Like better to think of yourself in a love story where you're rescuing this woman from the trap of monarchy, just as Meghan rescued Harry, than to think that you're the victim of sexual assault or coercion. Um, so I, I'm still, I'm at this point, maybe like Mikal on Dragoncast, I find myself quite sympathetic with him in this episode. Um, he's obviously um, a man who's, I think he is legitimately considering suicide, and that, that brings my sympathy, and we'll see whether they t- where they take the character later, but actually I, I'm more sympathetic, Sarah, than, although I do get the insta vibe, so now I have to go back and think again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I appreciate that, that more generous um, reading mm-hmm of him as in the in the sort of victimized position but i just for me the way that it was performed and the way that it was delivered and the way that she was so taken off guard and and this was something that i said about the last episode too that like one of the most tragic things about Mm -hmm. these two is that they completely misread each other from the jump and then build these like very elaborate kind of understandings off of those misreadings but um Mm -hmm. yeah his his like 180 when she turned him down just gave me like 
I'm yeah, that was, that was, that was it for me. And um, I, I don't know. I would like to, I would like to sort of incorporate what you're saying, but I, I mean, for me, like, I just, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I, I think they can both be true. I mean, I think, I think, I think the two can feed into each other pretty well. I think, you know, that mm -hmm. his victimization turns him into getting angry and wanting to take the power and, you know, yeah, that he was and, angry. And, he couldn't fix it for himself. Yeah. I mean, I can, I can, right. see, that. I can see that for sure. Right. I think they're all just dumb kids. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And also too long. So many light, light, um, like it's true that like he was victimized and all that, um, but um, like um, trying to assert a power dynamic afterwards, um, mm -hmm. of what was tempting is obviously just going to create more problems for himself, and um, it's just going to be worse for himself in the long run. I think that's what we're going to see in the last of the season, or in the short run, even <laughs> coming up soon. <laughs> Yeah, clearly. Um, okay, let's move on to Viserys, um, just because there's a lot in this episode about his declining health, and he talks about him dying and what's going to be said about him in the history, and no songs for him, and uh, was he a good king, was he a good man? Um, anyway, uh, all of that, so maybe just a few thoughts on, on that part of the episode, and then we get to the neatly juicy stuff i actually felt bad for him when he was asking um uh what's the strong name uh, Ly uh lionel uh, uh, lionel yeah. yeah yeah when when he was asking lionel if he'd be a good king at first i was like kind of laughing in my head because you know he's just remembered as a laughable king but then the way patty Considine acts i'm just like you you feel so bad for him yeah, it's the strength of Paddy's acting that he's able to be both comedic and genuinely pathetic and inviting of our sympathy. And it, it comes through in his career where he's gone from comedic to dramatic to, to, to very tense roles. Um, and, in you know, when you look at him in the context of everything we know about Westerosi history, someone who just gave peace and stability and maybe at the expense of his own reputation by conceding too much. But he wasn't prickly. He didn't just go to war on a humbug. And maybe the best kind of monarch is actually one that is self-effacing and who doesn't worry too much about their reputation for victories and being tested in the crucible and is willing to be seen as a bit of a weakling, but just keeps the peace, you know? Mm -hmm. But it is a little yeah. bit apropos well, de douche, so maybe not. <laughs> I I disagree on that specific thing that the uh, monarch needs to be like be able to to appear weak because um, if if anything we know, my opinion on that point is that any institution, be it be it democracy or anything, has you has to you have to have belief in in that institution and if you don't believe in the king's ability to assert himself then he is then people will lose faith and that will end up in any at any at some point to strife and people going uh, behind the king's back and doing things that are will eventually lead to strife and war so i think his i think his uh, his weakness is what brings on the war yeah, I agree. I think I could answer that he is a good man, but definitely not a great great king going by the sheer carnage of the, the Dance of the Dragons, really. Yeah, well, um, um, the other ear side and like social cap and all that, like uh, one text that we know from um, intertextuality is that, that George is very fond of is obviously the prince and then the prince um like there's the quote appear virtuous but don't be virtuous and um other quotes that um are very um related to the idea that um a king should um appear weak when uh appear um a rabbit when they are fox and appear a fox when they're the rabbit so um like there's this very um sort of 
um, Machiavellian um, criticism would be of uh, Vasari's idea of government in the plan. But the thing is, so, he's just a rabbit. He's he's just a rabbit. He's not he's not rat. He's not a he's not he's not strong or anything. He's just the bunny rabbit all the time. I kind of feel like in in retrospect that the deer he stabbed was a very striking, very sad metaphor for himself, um, where he's just entangled in these waves of expectation and kind of in the wrong place at the wrong time and, you know, noble, but but also restrained and hunted until he just can't um, can escape. I wondered if he wasn't just a little bit disappointed that he wasn't the one to to try the prophecy. <laughs> um, like how Rhaegar thought it was him for a while and then he realized it was probably his mm. children instead. Like I wonder if he's like some old man. I wanted to be the, yeah. I wanted to be the chosen one, you know, but I don't I think mean, talk about was... talk about like yeah, it is it is not a good thing to put on on your children's uh, uh shoulder like yeah. the idea that they could be the chosen one um it's not great <laughs> so he was like he, he didn't worry about the day-to-day -day because like he was pretty sure he could pull it out in the you know the apocalyptic crisis i don't know i didn't think that when i was watching the scene but in retrospect i feel like that would be kind of a funny angle on it yeah um okay addison's Kristen call go <laughs> i don't know i mean i think I, I have a clear understanding or interpretation or range of interpretations for Kristen cole which is someone who's ludicrously romantic ideals have all been crushed he realizes that the monarchy he looks up to is just a randy you know the heir the heir to the crown the queen is just a randy teenager he's lost his honor he's reduced from being you know he said in the last episode um i never dreamt that my name would be inscribed in the book and now that book is soiled you know so he's desperate and he is suicidal why i find this scene hard to interpret is because I don't, as I said before, truly understand how and why and what Alicent wants to achieve. And because I'm borderline kind of really angry, actually, the more I think of it, that this epic um, civil war started by two very smart, powerful women is reduced to a kind of high school spat and signaled by wearing a dress, which is, you know, reducing it to, oh, I'm going to put on a dress and call my banners, you know. I don't know what she's doing there. I mean, I, I wait for the rest of you to give me guidance on this. I felt profoundly frustrated and dissatisfied by it. There is no guidance. We're all lost. Uh, I feel like, I don't know. I'm just, I mean, I'm I feel just, like I'm she's just trying to get I'm... clarification here, you know? She's like, wait, she did lie to me. I want proof of it now. I've heard one side of it, but I need a little backup from someone who knows. And, you know, the big tragedy of it all is that Kristen Cole in his extreme guilt and, you know, sadness for having, you know, for what he's done and what he's done to himself, really. The word is stupidity. <laughs> right? That he, you know, that he, he, in the end, you know, he end, in the end indicts himself un unnecessarily because that's not even what she was asking him. I mean, I, I love, I, I actually really liked the horrible tragedy of it all is that he, he kind of destroyed his own life in this scene here because of his own, you know, guilt and, and anger. You know, I mean, just none of this was necessary because that's not what she was asking him. <laughs> I, I, I disagree with you, David, only on the pr premise that I don't think he destroyed his life here. I think his life was destroyed from, for him and his, he was guilt ridden to the extent that when he was pressed about it, he chose to do what he thought was right to get at, to... So, so I would say he is, he's a victim in this situation still, sadly, uh, and he is breaking. Yes. Uh, but in this situation, him feeling the, the amount of guilt and maybe trying to save the amount, last amount of honor he has, right. uh, is not his fault. If, if we go yeah. by the, uh, the interpretation that he was assaulted or yeah. I mean, he said no, as Sarah said last week, very powerfully. He was he was holding to his vows. He wasn't a political player and he's been dragged into politics. He's been dragged yeah. into having the most dangerous secret in the land, not only because just having done it, he could be at minimum 
uh, killed, if not mutilated, before being killed. But now the queen knows, he thinks, because he's been, you know, unfortunately drawn out. And if he thinks the queen knows, he thinks Otto knows, he probably thinks the small council knows, maybe, you know, the former king knew. The shame, the shame of having been sexually assaulted by a young girl, the shame of having ruined your vows. I mean, the guy must be absolutely desperate. The, the far more interesting scene is the one we don't see, which is what Alison truly does with that desperation. Right. I think um, that the scene was much more about Alison for me than it than it was about Kristen. And I mean, I, maybe that's not true in terms of like the fallout afterwards, but um, I was, I understood this as her sort of last ditch effort to learn or confirm or reassure herself that Renera was the friend that she thought she had and the friend that she thought she knew. And um, part of that I think was in response to the, the sort of bombshell that her father dropped on her that like, you really can't count on her not to just slaughter your children if she takes over. Mm -hmm. um, right. But it, I think that was the shock and the dismay was not only that, that Renera had lied to her, but that this was a person who unlike Damon, under no circumstances could be understood to have initiated um, so that, you know, not suddenly Renera is not only this person that she thought she knew, but clearly didn't, who lied to her face and swore on her dead mother that she didn't do anything, but also someone who, you know, feels or cares so little for the people around her and the people that care about her that she's willing to do this to this man. Um, I think all of that was a huge shock for for Alicent and, you know, maybe something that she was afraid of or something that she had started to suspect, but um, was confirmed in in no uncertain terms by this revelation. The double standard from Alicent is just mm -hmm. absolutely staggering. So you're not the friend I thought you were. Well, you weren't the friend she thought you were either when you married her dad. <laughs> well, she started yeah. it. No, I, I completely agree. Yeah, I mean, yeah. she, yeah, yeah. But I think maybe that it speaks also to our um, observations last week that not only is is Rhaenyra acting very much against Allison's Allison's interests or or belief systems or whatever, but that she's doing it with an agency that Allison was never allowed to have. So I think maybe there is that that further aspect of like she has this freedom and this is what she's doing with it. I still, I'm sorry, I still don't understand why she would go from. Uh, you know, it was one thing that she didn't like the idea of of uh, Rhaenyra and Damon having sex, but ha having sex with a, a knight, yes, of course, it's it's also a breach of some sort of honor. Um, but there's nothing in his story that necessarily made it so that he he went and told about what really happened. He just said that he committed the sin. I think. So I'm 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 saying I'm just saying that I I think she's overreacting, sort of, and I maybe because I I would not have reacted that way I can't I you can't relate to her, but I yeah I find her reaction unrelatable actually. Because actually, in in many ways, his revelation makes her position stronger because she can now just go to her dad and he can tell the small council, hey, I've got this daughter with these pure born kids. Here's this woman who's shagging, you know, her guard, and we can't trust her to be continent, and we can't trust her over the, you know, the 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 genetic purity of her kids. I mean, surely, I don't know. Nothing about what Alison does in this episode makes sense to me. I'll just leave it at that. I don't think she wants to be in that position. It may put her in a better position, but I don't think she wants to be in that position. Yeah, I yeah. agree with that, David. But I also think. We, we've said this a few times already. There's um, a lot of things in this episode that seem like they yeah, checked boxes that um, we have to have that kind of motivation for her to be truly uh, the green queen. And, uh, and I think that was all of it felt a little bit forced, uh, including this scene. Um, because yeah, it's not, it's, I, I agree that from her point of view, it shouldn't be really worse that it's Kristen and then if it had been Damon, except for the fact that she could have blamed Damon a little bit more, but I think the, the betrayal from Rhaenyra is the main thing. 
Yeah, um, I don't. I don't think it's worse. I think it's just either way. It confirms that Renera lied to her, and that yeah. she did this bad thing, even if it's not the bad thing we thought it was. <laughs> but she still could have clung to that shadow of a doubt. I think if it had been Damon, because mm-hmm. he's so you know charismatic and seductive. Whereas, like, yeah, yeah, true. Yeah, you know, I felt very bad for Kristen when like she she asks him to come and to sit next to her and. And and he like the just the dismay on his face this right. day. Oh yeah. Where I mean, why am I in this position? Um, was just terrible. Like these women keep keep putting him in in the worst position ever. And yeah, I felt bad for him. But then he goes and 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 does. Just, <laughs> yeah. What? And then it changes. So let's get to the um be wedding celebrations and and the wedding itself um there's there's a lot of it uh, a lot of things are hinted at here so we get a little bit of a lena damon thing that uh, i hope we get to see more in the future i mean more of her specifically because mm-hmm. she, she yeah. seemed like um she's great and we get the big like so we have uh joffrey is that his name uh lena's boyfriend Mm-hmm. Who I have to say was pretty stupid about just going to Kristen Cole and be I, like, hey, hey, I know your secret, oh you know God, mine. let's so, be friends. So 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 like, what? <laughs> um, just so stupid. Um, but then, what, what the, okay, did someone understand better than me what happened and how Kristen just lost it? I have an idea. Maybe. Okay. I think maybe uh, this at this point, He's just trying because he's already been spared once. He's trying to to you know keep uh, the the notion of their uh, disgrace uh, hidden, and uh, and Joffrey's a uh, you know blatant threat. It was a blatant threat. Uh, just drove drove him over the edge and made him you know not be able to tell the truth. Uh, ever again uh and he's he, yeah no i think it's i think it's uh, one thing i want which is wanted to note note on this one i don't think that the arranged marriage between two people who don't necessarily you know find each other sexually attractive um is a p- problem in in this you know world i think the problem with their arrangement was their boyfriends right <sighs> I think Kristen, yeah, Kristen and Joffrey are idiots, uh, both. Right. Both. both yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's but understandably fun. both. Understandably, they're both idiots. Like, yeah, they weren't. They weren't brought up in this kind of a setting, and they weren't intending. You know, they're they're both potentially going to be in a relationship with one of the most powerful people on the planet, <laughs> and that's not Did what he- they. They weren't they weren't brought up to do that, you know, or to understand Agreed. that world. Especially Kristen. Right. I um But probably probably I mean Jeffrey probably a Jeffrey either. I mean Jeffrey. Mm. I mean his his surname is so he's Sir Jeffrey Lonmouth. So I don't think it's he's from a very important house, clearly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he may as well be Sir Jeffrey Manwoody, right, for the status right. that he has. Yeah. <laughs> right. Exactly, and here he but, is. Here he is potentially now, you know, the fuck toy to the king. <laughs> yeah, well, the king consort. Um, yeah. I guess well, not, he'll never officially Chris- be that. Yeah, my my interpretation of Kristen Cole going. Well, you say that, but you know, Edward the Second's fuck toy, Piers Gaveston. I mean, you know, there's a long line of gay yeah. Yeah. English kings who've had kind of basically maitre son titre like you would with the sorry mary i should stop saying things in french in front of an actual french person because it's embarrassing <laughs> but um, but there, i mean there have been people with kind of like official court positions and pierre scavenston mm-hmm. and his horrible end was because people resented the power he had um i do wonder if Kristen cole going berserker was almost a suicide attempt mm-hmm. like i did this thing i lost my honor they're going to kill me, right? Oh, they're not going to kill me. Okay, so I'm going to do another thing that's berserker. Surely kicking off right. randomly. At all. I mean, whether consciously or subconsciously, I felt this whole 
episode he's kind of in a self-loathing death wish and he'll take he'll take out anyone who increases his shame which joffrey evidently does suicide by castle guard kind of a situation right. <laughs> why was there a delay i mean i understand that Joff what, what joffrey said to him was effectively a threat and that it was it pushed him over the edge but i mean it was like he in that if he had if he had just pummeled him to a pulp in that moment I would have a much clearer understanding of what went down. Um, but the fact that it was like all of a sudden and that like it seemed to have been linked to Rhaenyra and Damon somehow. And I, I don't know. I just, I felt like I did not, I watched the whole scene twice and I still feel like I missed something major that like puts all the pieces together. Which is, I think, I, would th I thought that was the intention. Yeah. You know? Yeah, exactly. Definitely, That's what I was about to it say. It was so dark too that I, I, I was also watching like at at dusk this morning or or dawn I should say and um the light was coming in through my window so I had trouble really trouble with it being so dark even seeing what was happening I'm like wait wait who was that wait was that strong wait who what what's going on <laughs> Yeah I think that was intentional but what I uh, didn't understand is the aftermath like mm -hmm. I didn't I didn't get how how we got from that scene to just oh okay marriage and and on the other uh, part mm -hmm. of it uh, so Kristen uh, and and Alison's uh, dealing with the aftermath uh, as well but like how how does he get to flee how is it, how is he not arrested or something how right. why don't we have like just a conversation being like what just happened um because if the intention was to show us how confusing it was for the characters in the scene uh they should express their <laughs> their confusion i don't know yeah. yeah i mean the fact that lenor still had the the handkerchief shoved up his bloody nose as they were saying their right. vows was like dude right. like just take a minute <laughs> like some st some stuff went down here that we should probably talk about like i don't know yeah it was bad by the way, was anyone else expecting the moment where Lainor goes over to Joffrey's body and, like, you know, rages his his despair? That to be, like, a moment where, oh, this thing we all thought was true was true. Like, I thought that was going to be his, like, self Oh, my God. Moment. I thought that was his self-outing moment. And then it Dude, that, that yes, got me really. so bad. Like, dude, are you, are you, you're in the fucking Red Keep in court. Like, what are you right. doing? They were yeah. already playing like hugsies during the dance, right? Like they were not that bothered me too <laughs> at all. Right. Like, yeah, it was it was very. And maybe like, that's why. Otherwise, how chill. would Rhaenyra know? I mean, obviously, this is common knowledge. Yeah. No, well, they grew up together. I mean, wasn't Renly like... kind of common knowledge? I mean, the guy had a rainbow flag. Yeah. Admittedly, <laughs> I read the whole first book, didn't realize he was gay because right. I'm a moron. But yeah. Well, just... rainbows weren't a thing until the 90s so <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah but still like for to, to us to us uh, modern readers and just to to the characters as, as well it was kind of known by the people close to him and i think that's that's the same for uh lena and like they mentioned that they did grow up grow up together so it, it's only i mean not recently, recently, but it's only been a few years uh, since they all got back to uh, Driftmark, I guess. And beforehand, he was at court and maybe his uh, very dear cousin, Rhaenyra, <laughs> knew. Yeah, I, I think we also have to understand how the idea, the notion of someone as being gay is still a very modern concept. I mean, mm -hmm. even, even 30 yeah, years true. ago, hell, even today, there are a lot of people who consider the the idea of identity as as not as a very modern concept even even people today have a problem with it. there's a lot of guys who who you know and and women i'm sure who like this is just something they've done but it they're that's not who they are and presumably there are some people in that category right there are people right. who are or rather it's a sort of it's a bit of a scale and a spectrum um mm -hmm. and right. you can have dalliances but not actually be gay but then there are lots of people right. gay who use that as a kind of as a construct to avoid, well, to justify self exactly. homophobia, I guess. But yeah, no, that's a really good point, actually. I do think it's interesting, yeah. and and really speaks to the probably on some level to the absolutely overwhelming arrogance of House Valerian that mm -hmm. um, Nysteria seemed to have like a much better understanding of how badly it would go for her to be caught up in Damon's 
like mind games and yet Lonmouth has mm-hmm. absolutely zero yeah. chill that like not gonna come back I mean obviously they're not gonna do anything to Lenor, right because he's like the future king consort but that they wouldn't just you know get him out of the way for appearances I don't know he just seemed mm-hmm. yeah. his his self-preservative instinct was less than zero and I I found that very shocking um in in this context I mean, that yeah that collective uh self-preserving instinct like Joffrey same uh, even Rhaenyra like yes she's the princess she's the heir but she she the whole thing it make it seem like she, she doesn't really she's not very careful about her whole thing with Kristen she's not even even then she's not careful with the way she behaves with Damon for instance at the dance and like it it doesn't seem <laughs> no, that's another it, it really seems good. like all of those characters are like not real um they don't understand the, the violence and the cruelty of the world that the world they live in which is crazy it shows their arrogance because, it shows their arrogance yeah. that they're above they're it all, that, that they're there all can't just be consequences kids. for me yeah this is this is uh, there's not going to be consequences i'm th- i'm the queen <laughs> i don't buy the dumb kid i buy the dumb kid thing for people like Kristen cole and maybe joffrey who weren't raised at court right but when you're a Valarian who at the age of seven is having to give a very artful political speech to the very elderly king about how you can get married and he can fuck you later, I don't think these, the kings, sorry, the kids in the Targaryen Valarian, the very senior houses, I don't think they have much of a childhood. And I think it's analogous to kind of, you know, you look at the little kids doing the whole of the funeral today. I mean, the childhood of Charlotte and George is over. Right. right. I mean, you recognize now that one day that's going to be you and, and, and this is a very different childhood. I, I, I don't think they can get away with excuse of just being dumb kids. I don't, I don't think it's that they're naive. It's I think that they're arrogant and that, you know, we're in power and we can do what we want. And I don't think that they'll, they'll and there won't be consequences. I mean, we certainly see lots of world leaders today who think they can do anything they want. And there won't be consequences. And sometimes they're right. I think the only way that we can really understand it is that it traces back to Viserys and how they, they believe that Viserys won't do anything to enforce any of it. I mean, I'd, like that's why Damon rolled back into the wedding when he was supposed to be in exile and like he got a chair pulled up for him. You know what I mean? Like we see over and over again that the the <laughs> the buck is supposed to stop with Viserys and he's just like, Ugh, whatever, you know, and I think that's one of the things that makes the um, a strong moment so shocking later that he actually does enforce that boundary that he's set. And like, we don't, you know, it's, it's completely unexpected from him clearly by everyone. Um, yeah. You all make incredibly good points, which I acknowledge. I mean, it is, it is amazing in retrospect thinking that Renera, as much as I've sort of seen her as my protagonist and the one I'm most sympathetic to gives two shits about Kristen. There is no concern about his feelings in any of this. He makes him as he makes her an offer of his hand in marriage and she sort of it's just it never occurs to her. Right. She looks this, at him like, what how, are you saying? <laughs> to, to him it's to her it's just yeah, I lost my V card with a hot night and she never thinks he might actually have feelings about this. Um, it's very arrogant and very privileged and I'm I'm a tag, I take what I want. And she right. learned it from her uncle, I guess, because she didn't, even from her dad, as weak as he is, he, when he had to take a second wife, he didn't take the one that was good for the crown. He took the one that was, you know, the one he wanted to bed. So why not, I guess? Yeah. Which is like, honestly, the targiest thing that he does, I feel like, in his life, which is, I don't know. Yeah. Um, let me, can I just uh, notice that uh, Lionel Strong you know, gesture to his son, Harwin, to break mm-hmm. things up or save the princess, or what was it? Was yeah, break such an bones. awesome moment. Yeah. <laughs> it was so really good. good. Hashtag it my strong. Really oh it's my a, God. It, was a, it was a strong moment. Hashtag, <laughs> hashtag yeah, it, it was, yeah, that was awesome. Hashtag strong moment. Yeah. Uh, that was good. I mean, Lionel has grown on me. He's not my strong, but he's a very good strong. Uh, and and Harwin, we've we've been like peppered at moments with him throughout the episodes, and and now he's starting to you know take character, yeah. become a character, and I like that. I like that's good storytelling. 
the way you don't you don't you don't you you show you don't tell him tell everybody that he's a strong person and he's really good at fighting whatever you just show it mm -hmm. can we it, just backing up from that moment just one second the reason that he had to do that was because how many people in that room gave absolutely zero fucks about what was happening to rainira in that moment right like the right? fact that literally no one rallied around her nobody cared that she was half stomped on the ground um, right, they, I mean, she's she could have she died in the middle, God. right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, as well, and obviously her sworn protector no. was. Well, unfortunately, the Kingsguard but... watching her. Well, the Kingsguard <laughs> who's supposed to be watching her is Kristen Cole, who's yeah. too busy pounding someone. At yeah, the moment, but, but there's yeah. supposedly <laughs> seven of them. And they, I know. There's, yeah. I'm sure there's one other in this room. <laughs> they should all have been there. Yeah. And I mean, even Damon just like dipped the fuck out when that went down. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, he... Yeah, where the <laughs> fuck did he go? I don't know. He's like, I gotta go. <laughs> like, I know, right? I have a real estate claim to press in the veil. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> or to go to my wife's funeral. <laughs> yeah, he very much is an asshole, Damon. I mean, they kind of all are, which is not yeah. making me very hopeful for the rest of the thing. I mean, like, I, I, I should have known getting into this that this would not be a happy story, but um, <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, this week's episode just got me like, York. oh my God, this is going to be bad. <laughs> this well, is it's a wedding, of course it's going to be bad. And, yeah. It's a wedding in this world. What do you think? It's just going to go well and be happy? <laughs> <laughs> When's that you, ever happened? Do you think George has a thing against weddings and that's why him yeah. and Paris never married? <laughs> Ooh, there you go. And imagine yeah. what would have happened if he did. <laughs> Confirmed. <laughs> I, think, I think you're right in that, Marie, that everyone's an asshole. I think even, even Allison is an asshole in the way you, we have all had that friend that's a bit too pious bit too self-righteous and uh and and you know saying you know judging you while you even though you know you, they don't say directly to you they're judging you and i, I think that's her yeah. role she's really just the highest asshole <laughs> can, we just, can we just take a moment for her epic shade when she called rainier's stepdaughter that was such a, oh, was know, such right? a small, right. beautiful moment where I was just like, oh, that was no. Great. Yeah. And that combined with walking out with the dress, it was like, that was just yeah. the icing on the cake. The, 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 little, the little kiss. <laughs> so, is, so is this the uh, scene with uh, black and green, or do we, will we get it, the, the real? We haven't gotten uh, the black yet. That, that's the big question. Is, will Rhaenyra uh, wear her black dress at some point? Yeah, is is this a flipped version, and we'll never get the black and the green scene, or is it just that she, now Allison is consistently dressing <laughs> green, and then uh, Rhaenyra will will say "fuck you" and and wear a black and red dress? I know. That sounds about right. I think. I mean, they they kind of have to have the moment because so. yeah, exactly. They have it's to so they ironic. have to do something, otherwise the faction names make absolutely no sense. Yeah, so since we're talking about the next bit in the show, um, what do you, how do we feel about losing some of our uh, actress, actors and actresses next week? Is that next week, right? We're changing casts. Yeah, well, you can see them in the upcoming, in the upcoming credits. I'm mean, not the credits, the, uh, the trailer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I feel they're very good, but maybe the next lot will be equally good and they'll not be okay. Just speaking about the sort of theatrical details of this, I thought that the rubies in her hair looked so cheap. And I found that just absolutely shocking that they were, I, maybe I'm- Low key know, notice too. Maybe I'm like not a ruby expert or something. And like the light colored ones are like the most <laughs> valuable or something. But like, it just struck me that they looked like, like stick on gems that you would buy at it, which is so- contrary to every single other detail in this world um mm -hmm. but i just i couldn't i mean i was just like i was mesmerized by them in just an an awful way and i don't i don't know why they bothered me so much but it was it was so striking because everything so else can we get so... a lead light the amount of money they spent on this can we get some fucking lights on 
I know, right? Oh, God, I, yes. don't, I feel like I'm, I have underestimated how well Mr. Dr. Blood calibrated our television because I have not, <laughs> I have not had this problem oh. at all this season. And I keep hearing from, it. From the moment Kristen stuck the first blow, I had no clue what was happening at all. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think they are like trying to show that it wasn't really um, light because they only had like fire to light uh, the, the, a room, which, all right. But does that mean I have to like uh, kill my eyes trying to see something? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, any, any last thoughts? We'll say in the end, I do feel a little weird having given a four and a half to an episode with a gay bashing in it. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it feels a little weird. But... <laughs> Shit, I didn't think of that then. Now I feel bad. <laughs> well, I suppose the point is we're meant to see it as as a bad thing, right? We're meant to see yeah, Paulus as homophobia as a bad thing. Yeah. I think I'd be more concerned with the fact that the only two gay characters are transparently the stupidest in the show. That's kind of <laughs> yep. Well, I mean, the other question is, it's not clear if 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 it was just a hatred for gays or if it was just or, you know, for that thing, you know, or if it's just that, you know, this was the threat to him, you know. Yeah, I will I mean, say I think that's Chris more. And, with, I think that's more where they were going with it. Yeah, I think with Chris and Cole, it is more of a threat, like. Right. You know, just that uh, that like toxic masculinity, like, oh, you're a threat right. to me now. Well, I also, right. I also you know, think rather than a homophobia thing. He did not yeah, appreciate so. his custom invitation to the side piece club. Like, yeah, <laughs> I think yeah, that was yeah. very much because he had already been very sort of righteously indignant. At Fucking being a whore, Joffrey. But he was almost. like, <laughs> yeah, he was like, what? I'm not in I'm not in the same category with you. And whether that was tinged with homophobia, I would not be surprised. But. Um, mm-hmm. But I think that right. it was the. I think it was more just the dishonor of it of being a mistress or exactly. being being a side mm-hmm. piece. Yeah. I don't think it was really the homophobic thing. I was. I yeah. think it was just how many people fucking know yeah. about my dishonor, which kind of right. multiplies and amplifies my dishonor because I'm a very messed up guy. But I've also just been assaulted, so actually he's not messed. He's messed up, not for. I'm saying messed up, not in a pejorative way. He has been messed up. Mm-hmm. Literally. He's very out of kilter. Do you think there was an air of, you know, who the fuck are you to be talking to me about this? Um, like, I don't know you. I don't, I don't. Um, yeah, so that, that that level of exposure had already happened. Like, I, I agree. Be nice and see where that would. The delay is still troubling me, like, in the way that, you know, he was stewing on it. And then just all of a sudden went to, like. I did, honestly, that seems fair for this character. I mean, he does. He's not he doesn't seem that impulsive. It feels like it was one of those things that like sat in his head and he finally was like, okay, enough. <laughs> yeah. I just feel like right. there had to have been some trigger that I missed and I, I don't know what it was. But... So Joffrey off camera suggested a four way and he wasn't happy. There you go. <laughs> Made some gestures. I would. I, I like... would have, if I saw Kristen go in front of me, I'd be suggesting a four way. <laughs> Well, that's your opening <laughs> bumper right there. There we go. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, David. Uh, I mean, we have note, to be Vok, right? We have to be Vok. <laughs> do we have burning points that have yet to be said? I mean, the wedding was super fucking depressing. And I feel like now right? that you've yeah. overused the rat motif, I think that's getting a little bit... <sighs> Like I, w- I was impressed yeah, with it. It's like half the like, episodes right. now. Yeah, I'm like, okay, I get it. There are rats. Like, which, again, is foreshadowing that we don't need to go into, but it's starting to feel very heavy handed in a way that it felt like world building before. And I, I don't know when that line tipped for me, but I think it was this, this use. I was, uh, I was very, this, this was, this was a very, like, uh, samurai moment, the whole Kristen Cole thing. Mm hmm. I like, like that uh, too. Yeah. Ha- Harakiri seppuku uh, sort of uh, thing he was about to do, and then mm-hmm. I think I think that sort of reminded me a lot of Akira Kurosawa's movies, where sometimes uh, they fall from grace and then they, you know, get lured into the like the antagonists um, group party, one of like the the spider palace and stuff like that. I I, I like that. Actually, because it's, yeah, it reminded me of, of movies that I enjoy very much. So maybe it is a nod. I don't know. Do you think you would have gone through with it? Absolutely not. I don't think so either. He seemed, he seemed ready to. I don't know. 
I, don't, I feel like he um, poked himself and been like, oh, and then been even more mad. Like, <laughs> uh, maybe that's unfair. Maybe that's unfair. But I, I uh, just, I don't know. He's just seemed so like. Yeah, I think it's unfair because yeah. he literally asked to be killed uh, by the queen. As like, opposed murder to me. Right, right. mutilated and tortured. Like, tortured. I mean, yeah. I don't think no, he was no, like, but just he, yeah. he was like, if we're picking, <laughs> you know, <laughs> if we're picking yeah. alternatives here. I don't know. I Yeah, I don't know. I'm, yeah. I'm, I don't know. He couldn't drink, drink poison or something. Yeah. I am being unfair, I think, Tim, but um, he really bugged me this episode. So there you go. Um, I do want to piggyback on what you're saying, Patrick. It definitely did give me, um, fuck. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. I almost said Sudoku. Um, <laughs> it definitely did give me like Akira Kurosawa kind of vibes. Um, however, I am really tired of seeing suicide or attempted suicide as plot points in shows when it's not necessary. Thank you. Um, I think you can a- address his anguish and desperation in a much more tactful way than just like, oh, yeah, he's just going to kill himself. You know, that's what people do when they're, like, down, you know. I'm just, I'm getting tired of just seeing it used in that way. Especially in a glorified, like, or arguably glorified. Yes, yes, exactly. Okay, so I, I agree that it should not be glorified, but... If it is supposed to, you know, hearten to a, a feeling, feeling of like the samurai honor, that sort of fe- feels in line with uh, right. the way Christian Cole is looking right. at his own position yeah. Fair and point. how he's fallen. So I think in in any other case, yes, it's cheap to have a, a, a almost suicide, but in this case, I actually think it fits to his character that he is sort of like looking at his honor in the same way a samurai would. And would be uh, if he if he hadn't, he, I think he like thinks he's expected to kill himself. So oh, yeah, I don't yeah. think it was. I don't think it was. I'm so depressed. I'm gonna kill myself. It's this is what I have to do. But maybe they could have just set it up a little better. I think mm-hmm. I don't know. It just it's it's one of the things that I'm I'm seeing more and more constantly, which is kind of weird. And it's it's that's an exhausting point, you know. I thought it was interesting that there was zero mention of the wall as a potential um, consequence for him. Mm-hmm. Yep, fair point. Like he yeah. was either gonna be killed or mutilated. And That's then what I mean. I'm like, are we not gonna do the wall, right. sir? You're not gonna. I mean, such an escalation. That would. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> require right. explaining what the wall is to people uh, who might true. not have uh, read the books or watched Game of Thrones. I don't think there are that many of them, yeah. but that. That's a whole new part of the story that hasn't even been mentioned. Uh, that's that's fair. In this, yeah, that is fair. Mm, yeah. Why did they move the wedding up? I mean, right. That I think like, the way I understood this was that okay, we need to we need to move fast and and be, be done with this. So, but but it doesn't make it doesn't really make sense. Like 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 I said, why didn't why didn't we see like a what the fuck just happened uh, conversation, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, we have had pretty substantial cut scenes before. Substantial in the sense that like they they went pretty far with them before they cut them. So I wonder if there wasn't like, you know, the sea snake pushing for an instant wedding to keep his son safe, or you know, which would have been a nice callback to to Rainey's fears earlier in the thing, where it's like you know, if if people are taking hot shots at people at like the opening banquet like let's just get this shit over with so that he has the protection of the king's guard and and there's no lingering questions as to like whether Damon's gonna swoop off with her or or whatever i don't know mm-hmm. yeah i guess they did just do away with the party right like yeah well i mean he, we were originally supposed to be having a week of parties before the wedding and then we just said oh here we are you know normally normally there's a lot of a lot of planning that would have to go into a royal wedding, and it's all just shot to shit. Oh, here we go. We're going to do it. <laughs> Are we going to get an Airbnb brief Airbnb refunds back, or what? <laughs> <laughs> Castle <I> think, Airbnb. <laughs> there's two points to that. I think it's. I think it was again. This is one of the uh, instances where I thought I thought it was too condensed. Mm-hmm. They or they could have made a like a, a several day time jump or once whatever. I don't. I'm not quite sure how they could have handled it, but necessarily better. But this felt wrong, in the sense mm-hmm. that we had to see him stand there and be 
you know, understandably be sad, 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 and dripping blood uh, from his <laughs> his uh, that that uh, I don't know. That's that's wrong. Second of all, no, nah, no, nah, no, no. That's just it. I I don't. I, the other point wasn't important enough. That was just what made it, you know, drop a whole another point for me. I was the tissue up the nose for me. I felt like, mm. you know, I'm like, <laughs> this is, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I guess that was a good way to show that they didn't take any time to think about it. And they kind of right. just like right. slammed the door shut on it. But I, yeah, I don't quite feel like they... Which, to be honest, sounds seems like a very Viserys thing to do. So, to be fair, I guess like yeah. I can see Viserys going, "Let's just do this. Let's do this. Get it over with. I don't want to deal with it." Yeah. <laughs> or that he didn't want to hear it from Sea Snake that maybe they were going to postpone it. Or yeah, I don't know. Right. Yeah. Or cancel it. <laughs> don't give him time. Don't give him time to give it second thoughts. And not only that, but maybe don't give time to let the story go through the realm before the wedding like let's make it happen before like everyone starts talking about it and oh yeah our our moment of you know laner outing himself and all of that let's not give that time to to fester let's just do it well it could be too that viserys thought once his nose started bleeding that like that was it for him right and so he needed rhaenyra married that moment so that she would be protected and have house valerian on her side and um, I mean, that may have been part of the urgency too, because he he was also <laughs> visibly falling apart in that moment. But and and then did fall over <laughs> at the end. <laughs> mm-hmm. So maybe he was right in that. <laughs> yeah, but so but it lacks some kind of dialogue, some kind of mm-hmm. just yeah. In my opinion, at least we um, needed something. Yeah. We needed something. Yeah, we need some. I mean, it, it's true with a lot of uh, things in this episode. I think, but. I mean, there was there was a lot of dialogue, but just uh, we we just jumped from one from one thing to the other um, really quickly uh, all the time, and that didn't feel very satisfying. This was lovely, guys. This has been a weird day and a weird week. Thank you. I, I yeah, thank you for being the words here. Of being Ted Lasso, I appreciate y'all. <laughs> <laughs> I really do. You all, this is the best of the community. It really is. It's so lovely. So thank mm. you. Thanks, Bean. It's all love. It is all love. Oh. <laughs> Thanks, Marie. Should we do an official ending? We need our we need our woo. Uh, should do 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 you do that counting in or just let's Three, go with it? <laughs> two, one. <laughs> I'm thinking too much, am I? <laughs> Right. Yes. To a roo. I mean, like people do yoga in the morning. People just should do a louder roo. It's so uplifting. Well, I know we what I'm going to do with my first cup of coffee tomorrow. Oh, the... <laughs> I'm going to do an aru every morning from now on. I bet you it improves me. At the very blood beginning of March, a lot. My neighborhood spontaneously started doing that at 7 p.m. every night. So, like, we were all in our houses in this like crazy lockdown. Nobody was going anywhere. And at 7 p.m., you would open the window and all across the neighborhood, people would just start howling. And it would go on for like two minutes. And then it was done. And it happened every night for like, I would say probably about a month it went on. Um, That's It was really awesome. Yeah, it was so cathartic. And like my kids were so excited about it because they got to just kind of like let loose. And um, (laughs) did that happen spontaneously? Does one person just do it? I think so. Yeah, I mean, there were mentions of it later on like the the sort of local... um, like Facebook and stuff but um as far as I know like it started and people were just like what the hell you know and then you would join in and then you'd hear the neighbor respond and it just kind of traveled all like we live on a hill so it kind of traveled like all across the neighborhood you could hear it like kind of filtering in it was so cool it was really cool I wonder if it evolved from the you know the applause for the for the first the first responders I wonder if it maybe evolve from that i don't know, I don't know. It, it felt much more primal than that but <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah we did the clap for the nhs and then in philip's block of flats in the first lockdown um every saturday at three o'clock because he has like professional grade speakers they would do half an hour of songs and people on the apartment block could like uh, request songs and everyone would go on their balconies and dance oh, wow. <laughs> which is really cute <laughs> and then he blew 
<laughs> he blew one of his really expensive speakers, oh. so then he stopped. Oh, <laughs> oh no. Uh, another victim of the pandemic yeah <laughs> absolutely um in denmark we had nationalized televised uh, singing uh every day both in the morning and the evening uh f- f- so we yeah so you could, it's you wedding, could watch isn't it? that's a bit like physical jerks big brother no it's, re- it's really good we, yeah. we we used to do that a lot in the like in the 80s and 90s and then suddenly it went out of you know out of way and then and then because of yeah custom and then and then when uh here corbett came came we uh thought we needed something to feel you know together again uh and uh yeah we we do value the the togetherness a lot here in denmark so that's uh i think we do we do thing together we'll meet again see a local chicago station did that too it was it was like every uh like Friday at like six or seven PM you'd throw on the radio blast it and everybody would go outside and sing and dance. Yeah, people need that, don't they? They need the catharsis. Well thank you guys. This was awesome as always. Yeah, thank you, Marie. Yeah, thank Bye you guys. everyone. Thanks, Bye. Marie. Bye guys. You, you did a Have good a job. Good night. Good night. Good whatever. <laughs> Cheers. If I saw Kristen go in front of me, I'd be suggesting a four way. <laughs> Um, Melos. What? Why is Grand Maester, the Grand Maester called Melos? And is that that's not a Restorosi name? Putting it out there. L, do you have a reasoning? Um, as in that he's maybe from Essos or something. Yeah. So, if he is from there. I mean, I, mean, I don't know I mean, the um, out-of-state admission fees to the Citadel. <laughs> <laughs> or anything like that. But um, I've, other than you know, women not being able to come maesters, I don't, I've, you know, haven't heard any like no foreigners. I mean, I know Westeros is extremely xenophobic, but I have not heard any kind of law custom down to where it's like Westerosi only or anything. So maybe that dude's just. Came in on a scholarship or something. I don't know. Yeah, he seems incompetent now. Honestly. I have, I, you know, I mean, this may just be my suspicious nature, but I think he's kind of like low-key, kind of like not, if not k- trying to kill Viserys outright, certainly intentionally not helping him. Especially yeah. with the scene where the uh, younger, you know, maester or the uh, apprentice was kind of like, oh, well, you know, these herbal, let's try something. And he just kind of like shooed him away or like, shut the fuck up. Get out of the way kind of thing. Um, so, I mean, that caught my attention. It could be nothing. It could be, you know, like anything else other than that. But I just kind of feel like that the Citadel and maybe with the help of Old Town and the High Towers had this big machinations of bringing down a Targaryen, starting with the dragons. Yeah, that's a that's a common theory, I think. Um, I'm just wondering if there's any meaning behind him when he's here uh, being not from Westeros. Because if you were, were like Brovosi, that would also be very much a thing that, you know, would support that he would, you know, try to knock off the uh, the series because they're not they're very anti dragons as well. Mm, mm, that well, yeah, that's a really good point too. Uh, and you know, again, it's not like we haven't seen like a non Westerosi person in like high levels of like power. I mean, there was uh, uh, someone from Essos that was on Jaharis's small council. Garl, I think yeah. that was his name. Yeah. So I mean, yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah. I was just thinking that's it's. Um, I don't know. It's gonna be. Uh, I don't. Know, I don't think it has any meaning to the show in general. That which is why I didn't mention it in the proper show. But I think it's interesting that he has a non westerosi name, and he's. Clearly not doing his job. <laughs> Clearly not. <laughs> so, yeah. I, I didn't, um, we didn't get 
a lot of dragons, but I was uh, surprised no one really commented on seeing Red Queen for the first time. Even though it was, albeit very brief. But just seeing Melis fly, uh, Rainus and Melis together flying, I thought was pretty cool. Yeah, I uh, I didn't pick up on it either necessarily. I just thought that they looked quite similar, actually, in comparison to, to some of the other dragons that are very different. You know, Viserys' dragon, well, no, Damus' dragon, where he, it's very long-necked. Those two look very similar. Like, maybe they were from the same clutch. Yeah, I think even for a second, like, Melis kind of looked like Drogon for, like, a half a second. Like, the same yeah. build, I thought. And then, of course, I went, like, oh, I wonder, is that clutch? Does she, Melis have a clutch somewhere? And could she be the egg mama? And, you know, things like that. <laughs> but I thought that she was, like, really beautiful. And I know we're going to see her later. Um, but I couldn't make out the second one. I'm assuming it was Sea Smoke. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. But I couldn't really make out the second one. But yeah, no, I was I, just happy to see him. Yeah, and I like it that you, you the term they're using egg mama. I like that. <laughs> it's a uh, yeah. I will call it that from now on. Egg mama. There you go. Egg mama. Yeah. <laughs> good. Yeah, good show. Good show. Um, what are y'all anticipating? Uh, just from the trailer. For next week, I haven't watched the trailer. Oh, you haven't? Oh, okay, well, no spoilers. No, as as in uh, as as within England, we don't get trailers connected to the show. Really? So you have to, yeah, you need to like literally seek them out. Wow. And, uh, okay. Okay. Well, uh, I shan't be spoiling anything in that case. I'm um, I'm assuming that the the grown up versions of the uh, Renaries and, and Allison are amazingly talented actresses as well. I've just got not gonna I'm just gonna be sad to see those two go. Um So am I. So is so am I. Especially um specific for me, um, Millie. I thought she did an amazing job. Both of them absolutely, but um Millie was definitely a standout for me. I was I was always looking forward to seeing her these past couple of weeks. So it was good. It's gonna be pretty sad. Yeah. But they do need a new act- actress to look as tired as, as Renera will look at the end. Yeah. You know, like, worn out. And yeah, I don't think as... makeup could uh, do that for her. So, yeah, they definitely needed to kind of edge that, kind of level up the stakes. I agree. 